I'm out of Toronto for a few days to see some family, and while I'm here, I thought it would be a great chance to shoot a test roll through this 1970s broadcast 16mm camera, the Frezzy LW16. This is a camera that's very similar to the CP16, which is also a very popular broadcast 16mm camera from around the same era. So I can't wait to check this thing out, find out if it's in good condition. I've got some old black and white film in here, just 100 feet, and we're gonna check it for crystal sync uh, operation, and hopefully it looks great. So the Frezzy definitely has some pros and cons in comparison to the much more popular CP16, which you can get a reflex model for. The Frezzy, this model is a non-reflex. I'm only able to see through the lens because it takes an Anjanu 12 to 120 zoom lens with a dog leg viewfinder. So it's a viewfinder that's actually attached to the lens so that I can see what's happening here. I am kind of going to be tied to this specific lens for most of the time when I'm using this camera, especially if I want to see through it. I can remove the special mount here and then it's a C mount camera, but again, without the ability to directly see through the lens that I'm using to shoot. As long as it's working though, it is a crystal sync camera. So it runs at precisely 24 frames per second, which means that I can sync up audio that's recorded separately when I'm recording footage on the camera, which typically a Bolex and smaller cameras can't do unless you have an extra special motor that allows it to run at crystal sync speeds. They take 400 foot magazines, either Mitchell magazines or even the CP16 magazines can fit onto these cameras so that you can put 400 foot rolls of film through them or 100 foot daylight spool rolls as well. You have to thread up the camera so there's quite a little bit of threading and it's very similar to just like threading up a 16 millimeter projector. But one of the big appeals for cameras like these, the Frezzy, the LP16, these 1970s broadcast cameras is that while they are limiting you can usually pick them up for pretty cheap. Like this came to me for about 550 Canadian dollars which is a great deal as long as it works. It does offer things in the way that the Bolex does not for my specific model, crystal sync speeds, 400 foot magazines, but I am a little limited in terms of like the lenses that I'm able to use well and having to rely on these old batteries or rig up a new power source for them. So I was looking for something that was really affordable, doesn't necessarily replace the Bolex, but does allow me to start learning more and get more hands-on with operating 16 millimeter on a different sort of scale. I do know that the camera was stored in good conditions in a studio for many years, which is great, but doesn't necessarily mean that it's in pristine working condition. It came with two old batteries, but only one holds a charge, which means I need to either get it reselled so that it can be functioning and charge again, or there's a plug on the side of the camera which will take external power from a 12 volt source. So I can also get that up and running as an alternative to using the battery. And before shooting, I also made sure to clean all the internal rollers with rubbing alcohol and a Q-tip so that nothing on the rollers in the transport should be scratching the film at all. So inside of the camera is some 1980s expired black and white negative film from the Russian film manufacturer Sfema. I'm not sure exactly what to rate this stuff at because it's quite old and I don't know exactly how it was stored. It was sent along to the P.O. box a few months ago, but I'm gonna expose it at 50 ISO, I think is a safe bet. And then just, yeah, you don't have to do anything fancy. So it's about 13 pounds, 14 pounds altogether on my, uh, on my shoulder. I don't know. Have enough. <laughs> like having a small child. Okay. So Six month old baby. <laughs> the less the less water that comes into contact with the camera while we're doing this, the better. Water in it. But I will warn you, this will hurt. This is your microphone, okay? You just hold it. Don't get it too close. Just hold it a good distance away. Not that close. Hey you go, Logan. We'll be back to pick you up later. Okay, three, two, one, go. This is a little bit of the history of the world. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then God said, let there be light. And there was still nothing, only you could see it. Now, we are in sunny Napoli, also known as Demarestville. Are you walking here with me? Yeah. Okay, so look at this bush over here. Maybe don't look at this bush because we cut the tree out of it and now it looks awful, but that's not my fault. I just did what I was told to do. 
If you come down here, you will see. Uh, yeah, turn towards me so I can see your mouth. Yeah. My best dad ever t shirt hanging on the line, which no one says is a false advertisement because there's a mustache there, but he doesn't remember when I had a mustache in 1974 when I was in the porn industry. I was a gopher. I used to get coffee for the stars and stuff like that. Uh, come over here, and I'll give you a real action shot of the water coming out. This is uh, on the second day when God made water because he needed co wanted coffee, but he hadn't invented water yet. There you go. And then God made a Keurig on the third day because he just got real lazy after a while. Okay, you know, over here... Look, there's a butterfly or moth floating around, flying around. Look, there it goes. Did you capture him? There's another one. They're all over here. This is the garden. You can walk up on the garden. Jeez, that's going to fall. There's lots of stuff growing in there. You can go down the hill where we light fireworks on Christmas Eve. Down the hill here. It's a good action shot of me walking in the... This is a very long yard that gets cut every 10 days or less or more. More or less. More or less it gets cut now and then. So here we go down here and you can see where God made the trees. Okay. This could be... Uh, the land of Eden, you don't know, because down the road there is Gomorrah Road. We don't want to talk about that. Sodom and Gomorrah, those people, we don't talk about them. All right, that's it. I think that's the whole road. Yeah. Uh, that was it. That was about 85 feet, which accounts for the 15 feet of film I lost and wasted while I was trying to, re trying to thread it. And uh, hopefully, I'll take this away. Drop about 80 bucks and uh, get it developed. Developed and scanned. Niagara Custom Lab, Toronto. So what have we learned from my test roll from the Fresolini LW16? LW, by the way, stands for lightweight. First of all, there is a hair in my gate. I'm aware of it. I saw it. You probably saw it as well. How embarrassing. It happens, but of course when you're using especially 16 millimeter cameras like these, then you definitely want to be really careful and checking this as you're shooting. It's harder with Super 8 cameras because you can't easily like get in there, remove a lens, check for things. So sometimes Super 8 cameras just have stuff in the frame and there's not really anything that you can easily do and you don't find out until you shoot a test roll. You know what though? I'm gonna give myself a pass on that hair in the gate this one time because what I really needed to know from this test roll was that the film was being transported properly through the camera, which it was. There are clear frame lines and everything is being exposed onto the film properly as it moves through the camera. It was also maintaining a consistent sync speed of 24 frames per second from beginning to end when I dropped the audio in. And I wanted to make sure that there were no glaring issues with the lens. And at the moment, at least, it doesn't seem as though there are. So so far, all of that is a success. This isn't incredible footage, but I didn't expect it to be. And I learned quite a few important basic things. Also, this FEMA black and white film was a mystery to me. And now I know a little bit about how it has not aged super well. It looks a little weird and inconsistent, but I have five more 100 foot rolls of it. So maybe just experimental or test rolls for other stuff in the future it can come in handy. And yes, cameras like these, really any of these older cameras that haven't been used in decades should be sent out and properly serviced by a professional. But that can be expensive and it's not always easy to find resources for all these different types of cameras, especially more obscure ones like this Frezzy, in order to have it properly serviced. But someday that's what I should definitely be doing if I'm planning to do much larger projects with the Frezzy. Shooting a test roll is super, super important on any camera, regardless of like if it's a photography or if if it's a motion picture camera. I know film is expensive, especially Super 8 and 16 millimeter, but you're gonna save yourself a lot of heartbreak if you buy a roll or a cartridge of film first 
with the specific intention of using it to test the camera instead of immediately shooting something that's really, really valuable to you, only to find out that your footage or your shots are just ruined because the camera is not functioning. Just trust me when I say that there's only so much you can know about a camera by just going over it, looking at it, putting batteries in it, and making sure that it runs. Without actually putting film in it and looking at the results of film and making sure that it is firing or shooting, transporting and exposing everything properly, that your internal light meter mechanisms and things are all functioning and knowing that for sure, that's the only way to know that these old cameras at this point are actually still working. And yes, I know the Frezzy is a limiting camera in terms of like what I can do with the lenses and the fact that it's not super 16, so I have to crop for widescreen, but I've long been interested in the 1970s style of shooting and those cameras, like the broadcast stuff. And I can't wait to plan out a bigger project to use with the Frezzy, which might be a little while. You might not see me talk about or use the Frezzy again for a little while because 16 millimeter is expensive. Also worth mentioning that my father did not work as a gopher in the porn industry in 1974, but when you ask your dad to just say some things on camera, uh, you don't know what to expect. Thank you so much for checking this out. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, I'll throw some links down below for the Frezzy. It's an interesting, more obscure camera. Uh, I do recommend the CP16 as a camera uh, to pick up if you're looking to kind of branch out. There are limitations to it. It's not as nice as like an Aeroflex camera or like the Atons, things like that. But these older 70s kind of broadcast cameras, while limiting, can be picked up usually on a bit more of a budget if you luck into one. Also check out the links for the Patreon and there's also merch for the channel. All that stuff supports this stuff. So if you wanna see more stuff with the Frezzy, I'll get out, walk around with it. I'll get together with my friend Jordan. We'll shoot some stuff soon, hopefully, but uh, any of that support makes all that just uh, more possible in the future, in the short-term future. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.